Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello, I'm Gary Miller, Provost of Wichita State University. Welcome to Wichita State and the World. Through this series, you'll meet researchers, top thinkers, and leaders whose innovative work is reshaping our community, the state of Kansas, the nation, and the world. On behalf of Wichita State, I really want to thank you for coming out today. Uh, I know that you're really busy and there are many other things that you could be doing. Uh, what I hope I can do is take uh, 30 or so minutes to describe to you some research that I've conducted over about the last decade or so and uh, highlight some things that I hope are really practical in the workplace, some ideas that, that focus specifically on a creative workforce and I am very much looking forward to hearing from you afterwards your questions and then conversing with you about these issues. Uh, by, by way of introduction, this is the result of research that I've conducted with uh, mostly with a colleague, Pam Tierney at Portland State University, over about the last decade or so in a lot of different organizations, some of them nonprofit, most of them for-profit, some of them R&D organizations, uh, even some manufacturing settings. I'm going to talk about creativity at its essence in the workforce uh, at the level of individuals and small groups. Now we know that organizations to survive and thrive at some point ultimately have to be innovative, have to generate new products, processes, services, but the genesis of that is in having a creative workforce, in having a set of individuals and work groups that can generate the ideas and ideas for implementing those new ideas that are going to get you there. So my focus is not on the entire innovation process here, but it's on the beginning, developing a workforce that is going to be creative and develop creative ideas for you. Now you can see from the title of, uh, of this presentation that a large part of that focus is on leadership. And I'm sure many of you have read any number of books about leadership. And in the last 50 years, I'd be willing to bet there are thousands of books that have been written about leadership. What is really notable about that is how little of that space is dedicated towards leading others to being creative. And if you think about it for a moment, it may not be that hard to really understand why that might be the case. First, the prime directive for organizations uh, operationally is to be efficient. Efficiency means doing the same thing the same ways again and again so that we can generate economies of scale, so that we can reduce costs, so that we can do things that are going to boost our profit margins, make us more competitive. Creativity really is, in the short run, the enemy of efficiency. Because being creative means that you're doing something new and you don't know how to get from here to there. By definition, being creative means being novel and original. That means you're not sure how you're going to get there, and you're often not sure how long you're going to get there and what it's going to take you to get there. It is very much something that is not efficient in the short run, although I think we understand that being innovative then generates new efficiencies later when our organizations can reposition products, can enter new markets, can tap into uh, new market segments, and do things that we haven't been doing before. But when we're focused on short-term results, uh, then obviously we're not going to think that much about being creative. Another reason why we don't see much emphasis on leading for creativity really has to do with the myth that only some people can be creative. If that's true, then creativity is something that comes from within you. And if you really believe that, then you're not going to bother in the workplace to try to develop creativity. If you want it in your workforce, you would hire for it. You would find some kind of selection devices and you would go out and select for that. 
Now, like a lot of myths, this one is dangerous because there is some truth to that. People are different in their level of innate creativity, in their natural propensity to want to be creative, and how comfortable they are with it, and what kinds of personal skills they bring to it. Uh, but there's a lot more to the story than that. And in fact, that idea is one of the reasons I became involved in this area in the first place. Uh, I was talking to that colleague, Pam Tierney, many years ago, and she was talking about some work she was thinking of doing in creativity, and I got to thinking about how I felt like I was really an uncreative person. I never felt like I had a creative bone in my body, and I hope that, that uh, all of you don't quite feel that way. And, it, and I became very interested in, well, what is it that really would, would be required to generate creativity and to do it at work consistently? And as small things sometimes grow into larger ones, uh, this really became a consuming passion for me for uh, over a decade. So what I'm going to do uh, in this talk is describe to you kind of a model that, that, that walks through what we have learned about building a creative workforce and about leading others into creativity uh, in different workplaces. Before I do that, it's probably useful for me first to kind of define what I mean by creativity. It's one of those things we know it when we see it, but what do we mean by that? Obviously, creativity involves novelty or originality. And when you think about being creative, you might think about eminent creators. They might pop to mind immediately, an Einstein or a Picasso or a Mozart. What's notable about that type of individual is that they are, not only is their work beautiful and elegant, but that the creations that they generated were created for their own sake. They weren't created for some kind of organizational purpose. Einstein did not create his special and general theories of relativity out of some need to satisfy an employer. Picasso did not generate his cubism and his paintings over 50 and 60 years out of some need to satisfy a social purpose or a social good. Mozart was not trying to satisfy a sponsor with his beautiful symphonies. In fact, the sponsor Mozart had did not want the music that he was created, wanted something much more mundane. So when we think about creativity, especially in an artistic and scientific sense, we think about novelty and originality for its own sake. But we know that organizations are quite different because our organizations, whether they're for-profits or non-profits, have a purpose. They have a mission, a set of goals and a set of objectives that really serve as the reasons for their existence. And so creativity in an organization looks different. We're not likely to accept creative activity that's just creative for its own sake. Gee, that's creative, but it doesn't do us any good. Instead, creativity has to have a second component to it. It not only involves novelty or originality, but it also involves usefulness or practicality. And so that's the definition of creativity that we have used uh, for this period of time when we look at creativity in the workplace and when we say that something is enhancing an employee's and a work group's uh, ability to be creative in the workplace. One thing that's also worth noting about that definition, if you think about it for a moment, that means that creativity is not the same everywhere. We know that creativity is quite different, for instance, in different cultures. It's viewed differently. Uh, Indian culture versus Chinese culture versus U.S. culture views creativity quite differently. I've conducted uh, creativity research in all of those settings, and uh, it's very notable uh, how socially and organizationally creativity is viewed differently. It's also important to bear in mind that what ultimately is in the workplace is considered creative down the line is a function of what the market deems as creative or innovative. Uh, practices such as employee governance are old hat and have existed for hundreds of years in academic workplaces. But in other workplaces, and, and so they wouldn't be novel in this workplace. In other workplaces, they would be quite novel and new uh, because the market sees it quite differently, a very different industry and a very different market. Bearing this definition in mind, let me highlight before I describe the research three things that really uh, are required 
for employees to be creative. Uh, this particular graphic and these ideas come from Teresa Amabile at Harvard, who's done a great deal of work in creativity. Uh, credit where, where credit is due, because it's excellent work. Basically, the idea behind creativity for employees is that three basic things are required. The first is fairly simple, and it's what all employees require. Resources to get their job done. Now, this could be staff and money, but more importantly, I'm really thinking about time and information. Creativity requires expertise in an area. If you, creativity very often involves a synthesis of putting things together. If you, have, if you don't have the building blocks of knowledge to put things together, it's very hard for you to be creative when you don't understand an area fairly deeply or when you don't have access to others who can provide that resource because obviously we can't know everything. Another thing that's very important is the ability to think outside of the box, creative thinking skills. Now, I did mention that, that, that we do differ a little bit in how naturally this comes to us. Some of us are much more creative or blue sky thinkers, naturally. Some of us are not. The important point here, though, is that everyone can improve in this and everyone can be trained to some degree. And part of the job of leadership then becomes creating those opportunities, whether they're through training or whether they're through making changes in the job itself, in job design and in job interactions that are going to create opportunities for individuals to develop these kinds of skills. Finally, somebody might have really great creativity skills and they might have all the resources and time and information and expertise they need to be creative, but if they are not intrinsically motivated, internally motivated to create, chances are they will not create. Now I'm focusing here on this idea of internal motivation because creativity is something that requires a great deal of persistence, something that is challenging. Uh, there is no roadmap for being creative and that means that sometimes creativity involves failure. That's a dirty word for us in the organization. Uh, and that's, that's something that I'll come back to a couple of times as, as we go through uh, this discussion today. The motivation to create really might be the most important of the three of these because if you really want to make something happen creatively, you can go create and find opportunities to develop th creative thinking skills even if you don't have them. You can go seek out resources and if you can't have this yourself, you can go find others that can complement what you don't have. So of the three of these, this may be the most important because it's the one that provides the motive force and direction for what you need to do. Ultimately though, the graphic highlights how all three of these are needed. Creativity lies at the intersection of appropriate resources, creativity thinking skills, and the motivation to create. Now happily, that motivation may come from within, but organizations can affect that, both directly by enhancing our motivation and also through reward systems that are consistent with the idea of internal motivation. Now, where exactly do these things come from? That has been partly the, uh, the focus of our research. And so what we have looked at is, is two key factors in this research. One of them is leadership and especially how leaders can generate and provide the kinds of resources and provide opportunities for developing creativity uh, uh, thinking skills and techniques in individuals and how leaders can affect how employees see themselves creatively. In other words, their motivation. It might be fairly obvious or apparent, sure, leaders can affect creativity and not quite so obvious what I mean by employee creativity self-image and how that relates to motivation. We have known for a long time that eminent creators, again you can think of Einstein or Picasso or Mozart, often tend to have a really strong image of themselves as being creative. That despite setbacks, despite problems, they did not stop because they had a very strong belief in their own capability as, a, as creative individuals and their own confidence in their own ability to create. I have already said that creativity is something, especially in applied circumstances, that is difficult, challenging, uh, fraught with setbacks. It requires persistence. It requires the ability to persevere when you're not getting any positive feedback. 
what that means is that you really do need a strong sense and belief in yourself to, to, to move forward because very often you are going against the grain when you are doing this. You are rocking the boat. All of these things mean that somebody really has to have a strong will, a strong sense of self. And what was very interesting to Pam and I is that almost no one had really looked at that particular issue in depth other than, than uh, stories and anecdotes. And so what we wanted to see was exactly how leaders affect how individuals see themselves, the confidence they have and the self-image they have, and, and, and how does that impact their willingness to engage creatively. The, uh, the model that we generated, and this is the result of that decade or so of research, is described by something called the Pygmalion effect. Pygmalion in Greek mythology was a sculptor, and he sculpted a statue that he fell in love with, and he named that statue Galatea, and he prayed to the goddess Aphrodite to make Galatea real. Now, as Greek tragedy goes, uh, he had to suffer and go through trials and tribulations for a period of time, but eventually Aphrodite relented and did make Galatea real. Now what that story highlights is something we know better by another name, and it's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. The idea that our desire and belief that something is and will be will bring us to act in a way that actually will make it happen. And this self-fulfilling prophecy idea is the basis for what we were looking at in how leaders can affect, for good or for ill, uh, the creativity of their followers. And in particular, what the model describes in an overview is that leaders very quickly form expectations of their followers. This one is going to be a high performer. This one is not going to be a high performer and will need more help, will need more support. I can't give this one as much rope. They basically very quickly, and a lot of research has shown this for 30 years, divide people into in-groups and out-groups. Well, the difference is that people in the in-groups are, those are relationships where there's a great deal of trust, there's a great deal of loyalty back and forth, there's a lot of contribution back and forth going on, there's delegation of responsibility. There is the idea in that kind of setting that uh, leaders are providing more resources to subordinates in different ways. And it turns out some of these resources are things that greatly support creativity. It's not so much that individuals in the outgroup have a poor relationship with the leader, but they have a more formal, hands-on, monitored relationship with the leader. They're not trusted quite as much. So they don't receive as much. Leaders establish these expectations and then sometimes make them real by behaving differently towards individuals. And there is a great deal of support uh, for that idea. Well, what we looked at was how leaders behave differently then towards these individuals and how those different behaviors, which, which of those behaviors were things that really supported creativity and didn't support creativity. And what were some of the particulars about who was getting behaved at differently and who wasn't. How this affected followers' creative self-image, their sense of whether they are creative, whether they could be creative, and just as importantly, whether their leaders wanted them to be creative. All of this ultimately impacts the decision to, creative, uh, to engage creatively, to perform creatively. Because creative performance is as much a function of persistence at being creative as it is actual innate skills. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do with the balance of the time is kind of break down a series of findings going from left to right in that model, starting with how leaders categorize individuals and walking through the different kinds of behaviors that they show them uh, and, and how this can affect how subordinates see themselves and how that ultimately impacts creativity with some specifics. So first, you know, I've, I've noted that leaders do divide people into in-groups and out groups. And in doing this, they're really communicating a great deal of trust and confidence to them. What we wanted to know was what exactly is different about what leaders are doing for people in the in-groups that affects creativity. And through a series of studies in 
uh, I think about five different kinds of organizations, including a nonprofit. Uh, and some of these, are, uh, one of them was a research and development organization, another was a manufacturing setting, another was a, uh, a set of managers in another organization, another was a, uh, the operation setting of a, of a computer firm. Uh, in many different settings, we looked at the behavior set that leaders were engaging in, and we ultimately found that leaders engaged in six different categories or dimensions of behaviors that seem to be most supportive of creativity towards those people in the in-group. One of them is familiar to us, the idea of role modeling or do as I do, not as I say uh, in the organization. This is particularly important. It does really two things for employees when, when leaders try to be creative themselves, show the value of creativity. Uh, by taking calculated risks in their own behaviors and making sure that, that, that followers know this. Uh, one is that they teach followers how to be creative by observation. Another is that they highlight that this is something we want here. This is something that's valued and positive. Both of those are really necessary. Uh, another set of behaviors uh, actually is something that, that is more indirect. Jobs that don't give people freedom of action don't let them create anything new. The, the quintessential type of job that, that, that lacks freedom of action is an assembly line job, where doing the same thing the same way again and again is specified. That's efficient, but it doesn't allow anything new to be generated. The more autonomy and freedom of action in the job in terms of the decisions to be made, when to make them, what work to do, how to do it, who to interact with, you can think of any number of other factors that would go into, into that, provides opportunities for individuals to be creative, provides opportunities for individual to, individuals to generate those creativity thinking skills that I've mentioned and to sharpen them and to improve them. Another factor that's not quite so obvious is encouraging collaboration. There, there, there is a myth that creativity comes from within and it's a solitary enterprise and, and I think it's encouraged when we think about somebody like Einstein or Picasso we think of some spark within individuals that, that, that fully blown generates creativity. What is interesting is if you've ever read biographies about eminent creators you'd find that most of them were deeply involved with their colleagues. Einstein was deeply embedded in all of the research that was going on had constant conversations with colleagues uh, over his entire career, constantly interacted with them, constantly sharing information and ideas. And in fact, in the years between uh, 1906, if I've got that date right, when he published the special theory of, of relativity, and it could be 1905, uh, and 1916 when he published the general theory of rel relativity, one of the reasons he struggled is because he did not have a handle on the math that he needed to have. He brought in a colleague to help him. Picasso went, began painting at a very young age. And his painting originally at that time uh, was uh, in the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist tradition. He knew the people who were these painters. He knew that work deeply. Creativity is something that comes from expertise and knowledge. And we understand this in organizations when we start implementing things like knowledge management systems, things that let us share information broadly to try to enhance creativity. But it's not as often as widely recognized that it's really a leader's role to help enhance that idea sharing in the organization that, because creativity is largely a collaborative function. Uh, I, I might be a good example of that because all of the work that I'm talking about here today was generated in collaboration with a wonderful colleague, Pam Tierney at Portland State, and chances are really slim that either of us alone could ever have, have generated these ideas, that we, we managed to generate a synergy together in collaboration that we could not have done alone. So creativity, especially in the workplace, especially in work-related outcomes, is a collaborative enterprise. Something else that's really required is actually some explicit direction. I'm not sure how many of you in your performance evaluations have explicit creativity goals. I, I would think that it's probably not very many. And for those of you that do, it's a very small part of one of many of eight or 10 or 12 dimensions that you're measured on. We know that what's, what gets measured and emphasized is what gets done. 
Creativity often involves rocking the boat, doing things differently, and unless we actually make this an explicit goal for individuals, part of the reward system, part of their performance appraisal system, and part of something that we're constantly setting objectives and goals for and encouraging, it's simply not something that's going to happen for most people. Task support, resource support is something that's quite necessary that we found. Uh, as simple as, uh, as time and supervisors or leaders facilitating information sharing. Finally, because creativity involves a difficult process, it may come easy to some, but most of the time it does not. You can think of Thomas Edison and his thousand failures before he actually reached success. It requires a great deal of persistence, and part of the job of a leader, some of the things that leaders do that encourage creativity in the workplace, we found, was actually building individuals' confidence, encouraging creative action. What this can mean is, is not only encouraging people to be creative and supporting their creative efforts, but supporting them when they don't succeed at first. Do not punish initial failures to be creative if you ever want to see creative efforts happen again. And as simple as that is to say, it goes against the grain for us, especially when we're under short-term pressures to produce. All of these things were behaviors that we found were supportive of creativity. Now, I have said that leaders don't provide these sorts of things to everybody. They tend to provide them to the in-group. What I'd like to show you is the results of some research where we looked at how employees responded to this. And what we found is that employees did not respond in the same way. In one study in, in an R&D organization, we looked at a factor related to people's creative personality. I've mentioned already that we do differ a little bit in our creative capability. And you can talk about individuals having a cognitive style, a way of approaching creativity, and really talk about two types of individuals. One type of individual can be called an adapter. And that's somebody who tends to play it safe. They are reliable. They, their personality tends to make them more towards being conformists. They like being precise in their work. They do not feel necessarily comfortable with breaking rules or being creative. Their counterpart on the opposite end of the spectrum are innovators, people who are blue sky thinkers. They're paradigm breakers. They like creating new things. And, and uh, if you've had some experience with these folks, they can sometimes be abrasive because they do like to break rules and be different. What we were very interested in is how these different types of individuals would respond to these behaviors. In other words, were they in the in-group? Did they have a strong relationship with the leader? Or did they have a weak relationship with the leader? Were they in the out-group? And what we found was something very interesting. What the graph shows on the far right-hand side, when we look on that bottom axis at people who are innovators, is that innovators, leadership didn't matter to them. They were motivated from within. They had creativity thinking skills, largely innate, and they sought out whatever resources they needed on their own. In other words, these are the people you think of as being self-starters for creativity. And so this kind of leadership didn't, didn't really affect them that much. The lack of it didn't affect them that much. Obviously, a total absence of leadership uh, would affect them, but in the range we were looking at in our study, it did not affect them much at all. Particularly interestingly, though, is what happened with adapters, the people who are not the natural creatives. When they were in the outgroup and they did not receive support from the leader, they were totally uncreative. And you can see that by that bottom left-hand point on the graph. They were lower than any other situation. But when the adaptives, the people who are not the natural creatives, received support from the leader, they were nearly as creative as those who were. And you can see that by the upper left-hand point, that they were not far off in their creativity from the erstwhile creative types. What this really highlights is that it is a myth that only some people could be creative. Under the right circumstances, every employee can be creative, but they need different things. Innovators really do not require as much coddling or help in being creative as adapters do. Now, this might make you wonder then, when we look at, at groups made of adapters and innovators, what would happen then if the, if the leader then provided this kind of support to everybody in the work group? 
And we looked at that in a series of other studies, and what we found was something really interesting. When leaders give broad spectrum support to employees, not just a few, not just picking out a small number, but giving this more broadly to a large number of employees, they create a dynamic within the group itself, a synergy or a catalyst effect whereby they're not, leaders then are not the only source of that support. They basically empower the group as the group develops its own creativity skills and its own resources and its own motivation to help each other become creative. They create a second source of creativity in the group. We uncovered this by looking at, uh, at research, uh, researching in a series of studies where we looked at different levels of support from the leader and what would happen to an individual who was the only person in the work group or among the only people in the work group that were getting support from the leader. In other words, will this work? Can leadership work in supporting creativity if I'm getting it and maybe you're getting it but almost nobody else is? Or does it take more? What we found is that leaders alone really can't make this happen. That the highest level of creativity is shown when individuals have a personally good relationship with the leader. They're in the in-group and they're getting these behaviors. But so does everyone else, that they're getting a high level of creativity support from the work group. Part of the reason this happens is because in its absence there are mixed messages. So much, what this also highlights is how collaborative creativity really is. How much support and help is really needed to develop a creative workforce that can generate creative ideas that can help begin the implementation process. That we might have various uh, isolated creative individuals around us, but we're not going to be able to take advantage of them unless we create a climate for creativity in the organization. And climates, they may be kicked off from the top down, but they actually build from the bottom up. And, and this was, was really an eye-opener for us because we were not really expecting this kind of result when we, uh, when we went into this. Now, with this context in mind about how leaders directly affect employee creativity and how coworkers can, as they are empowered by leaders, as, uh, to uh, how they can affect creativity, I want to spend the balance of my time looking at employee perceptions of all of this. How do people actually make sense of, of these things and what's going on in terms of creativity in the workplace. What you're seeing here is an expanded version of that model that I showed you, the middle and right hand portions. And what we looked at was how all of these things, leadership and coworker relations and support from coworkers, affected how individuals saw their own creative capabilities, how, they, they, how it affected their beliefs and their own creativity, and then how that affected their willingness to actually try, persist, and ultimately succeed in being creative. One of the things I've, I've noted is that people respond to leaders and coworkers because it provides messages to them about who they are, about whether they can be creative, whether others see them as being creative, and this affects their, their willingness to engage. One of the things that we found in the workplace is that inputs from the social environment, meaning leaders and coworkers, and also inputs from the job itself affect people's confidence, their, their belief in their own capability of creating. You're looking at a situation in this graph where individuals are making two different judgments. Do others think that I'm creative? And does the job require me to do it? The situation for, the best situation for creativity we found was when you can answer both of them as yes. When you make, when, when, when you perceive as an employee that leaders and coworkers actually do believe that you are creative, can be creative, and that you have a belief that, well, I also need to be creative to get my job done. My job requires me to be creative. Others may consider you creative in the workplace, but if you think your job does not require you to do that, there is no reason for you to do that. It is not so much a matter of motivation, but a matter of how you interpret your job requirements. 
this is another place where leadership is particularly important in communicating and creating jobs that, that will require creativity and freedom of action and in communicating that need to be sure. In the absence of all of these things together, support from leaders, support from coworkers, and a job that allows creativity and, and perceiving that it really does require that kind of action, creativity doesn't happen. If you see on the graph that the only place that shows high creativity is when all three of these are present. What this highlighted to us is how difficult it can be to generate creative action in the organization. There are a lot of other things that go into it, but even in this limited set of factors that we were looking at, all three of these had to be in place simultaneously for us to find individuals generating the kind of confidence that ultimately results in them being creative. Now finally, this leads to something that's the last part of the model. If we succeed in developing a workforce where individuals have a belief in their own capabilities and their, uh, their own sense of self as being creative, is that going to result in creative outcomes. We conducted research, this, uh, this particular graph is from a study that we conducted in Taiwan looking at individuals whose jobs required a high level of creativity. And we looked at, at two different types of individuals, those who did have a strong belief in their own capability and their own sense of self as being creative, those who didn't. And what we found is there is one key factor that can either enhance their creativity or absolutely prevent it. And that is their perception of whether the organization itself, not immediate leadership, but senior leadership at a higher level, whether there is a culture in place and top management itself is actually going to value creative actions. Now sometimes it's fairly obvious to us that this has an effect. In this case, the effect was dramatic. Those individuals who were high creatives benefited from believing that the organization actually valued that kind of action. Those are people represented by that top line showing an upward slope, showing that uh, the more that they had a creative self-image, the more creative they were. We found something very interesting though, and it's, and it's really something worth bearing in mind, is what happens to those very high creative types, those who believe in themselves, when they don't think that the organization supports creativity. If you look at the bottom line, you'll see that it's sloping downward. What it means is that when these high creatives, these people who had a belief in themselves, thought the organization did not support creativity, they were less creative than the non-creative types. And you might wonder why. Well, if you think about it for a minute in terms of, of people identifying with being creative, it's who they are. When people have a really strong belief in their own capability, it's an identity to them. It's something very important. I'm a professor, and if you took that away from me, all the things that we do, I'm not sure I'd know a, a lot about who I am anymore because it's become so embedded in me. And a lot of us are that way. There are parts of us that are so important to us, they, they make us who we are. The stronger individuals have this image of being creative, the more important it is for them to express it. And when the organization says, we don't want you to do this. They're not just saying we don't want you to do this, they're saying we don't value who you are and we don't believe in who you are. That is personally a very threatening message. And what we found is that individuals were very likely, if they were high creatives, to, uh, to hide, to not even try to be creative because they were afraid if they tried, they were, they, they were gonna get battered around the head and shoulders for it. And this would basically tell them that not only do we not want you to do this, but you're no good. We don't value you as a person. In, in the, the old Beatles song, the old John Lennon song, they were hiding themselves away. These people are at risk for leaving the organization and finding a better fit somewhere else in a place that does value who they are. So to recap briefly, as I've walked through this, our, our research really focused on how leaders behave differently towards individuals and how individuals can respond differently ultimately how this all of this is interpreted by individuals and how under the right circumstances you can generate creative engagement in the workforce what I want to leave you with is two takeaways first leaders at all levels can have a dramatic impact on followers creativity they do it 
in mundane ways by providing resources and tools and generating the capabilities that individuals need and helping giving them opportunities and providing situations to enhance motivation. They do it by providing jobs that allow individuals to stretch and grow and create. They do that by setting creativity direction. And especially they do that by supporting creativity widely and building a creative culture in small groups that expands outward, that provides a catalyst or synergy effect whereby now leaders are not the only source, but that we are all supporting each other's creative efforts and building our creative skills. All of this sends a message, and the message is simple. Creativity really is valued here. Leaders do this by changing how people see themselves in the workplace. What leaders really have to do then is to help individuals answer three questions. If you can help individuals answer those questions in a positive manner, then you are going to uh, get much closer to generating individuals and work groups that are going to be more creative, and that is the building block for innovation. Uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to come here, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions, so let's go on with that. I'm wondering if, uh, if countries and societies can be affected, can, can lose creativity and gain creativity, and I'm thinking about, I've read recently about the Chinese who were so creative and, and uh, came up with gunpowder and uh, uh, all sorts of other things, but suddenly about the 12th century when their form of government changed, uh, the creativity went away. Uh, entire societies and entire countries can, do you see that not just within the workplace? Well, it's not so much that creativity goes away. Uh, Chinese creativity is a little different because in, in, when we think especially of artistic and scientific creativity, we celebrate the novel, often for its own sake. Uh, that has never been the case, you know, stemming from, from Confucian times. Creativity, and, and it is reinforced by, uh, by different governments and different forms of government and a collective mindset, but creativity is is definitely something important in Chinese cultures, but it has to be something geared around a social good. There has to be a, a positive or social purpose. It isn't celebrated for its own sake. And so as governments come and go uh, that reinforce those values, those collectivist values, then that makes it become less apparent. Uh, to us, it might look more incremental. You can think about Chinese silk painting. Uh, it can be very creative, but there's a really strictured set of rules in silk painting. Certain types of brush strokes, certain subjects have to be followed. And so it's, it's really more that it looks different. Uh, and, and we may not always recognize it in the way that we see creativity. You mentioned uh, several times creating the op or providing resources as a leader for uh, your staff to be creative. Uh, for me as a leader of a staff that, uh, whose job is to be creative every day, uh, the challenge is to provide opportunities for inspiration. And you never really mentioned inspiration in your talk. And I see creativity as being sometimes one great aha moment or inspirational moment, or sometimes a series of small inspirational moments. How do you, how do you play that into your research? Well, it is both. And, uh, you know, you're, you might be thinking of the transformational leader, somebody who inspires others with, with visions of, of doing something very differently. That can work. There was, you know, I, what I've got to say is, is what I've talked about is, 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 is far from a complete picture of what's going on. There is no way to tackle a topic as broad as this and, and really give you an entire picture. It's one route toward it in what leaders do. Uh, leaders can be inspirational and can have that effect. But it's also true, and when you think about, about how things happen at places like, like the, uh, the design firm IDEO, uh, that sometimes a leader's job is to set the table and get out of the way. And I'm sure you've probably seen that at times, too. And so it's really more a case of different paths in doing it. Uh, because if, if, if the only way you could get to creative workers is to have a creative leader, then you know, we've got a little bit of a paradox there. Uh, and and I, I think that's, that's not necessarily true. And most of our work has focused on, uh, on 
leaders that are not necessarily creative. We have done some other research, and I didn't highlight it here, that shows that leaders who are strongly motivated to be creative uh, seem to pair well and enhance creativity in followers who are also strongly motivated, that they create a synergy effect. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily speak directly to the, the inspiration aspect of it. So I think there's different paths, but we really haven't, I, I really haven't spent that much time looking at the inspirational side of leadership. As a leader, ha did your research disclose anything that would be helpful in the sense of how do you foster creativity and reward creativity at the same time avoiding the disruption and inefficiency involved in people charging off on divergent paths? Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, one way to think about leading for creativity is that for people to be creative, they have to act a little bit like children sometimes. But children need an adult around that reins them in, that, that knows, we know this with their kids, is we don't want to stifle everything they're doing, but we can't let them run wild either. And sometimes the role of the leader is to, every once in a while, come in and play the adult and say, okay, let's get a little structure here. Let's, uh, let's, let's stay on task. You're spinning off on tangents. Uh, let's get this done. Uh, and then stepping out of the way and doing those things that support then the individuals being creative. So it's a bit of a push-pull. Uh, individuals being creative naturally uh, are, sometimes may have, have a hard time self-policing because you're, you're talking about conflicting impulses. Creativity expands and does things differently and then it has to contract. There's also trying to separate the creative process into two things. One of them is generating ideas and solutions and that involves creating new and novel things and ideation. Then we can move people into a more structured process of evaluation. And they really need to be separated because uh, we need to have very open thoughts to create new ideas, the idea of brainstorming. Uh, a, a very positive approach, a positive mindset, and research has shown that, that when people feel positively and have, have positive emotions and affect, they generate more ideas. But then we have to evaluate those ideas. And interestingly enough, a little bit of negativity, a little bit of dissatisfaction, a little bit of needing to f close some gap, some requirement in the organization, uh, actually serves to enhance that, uh, that evaluative process and say, okay, we've created all this stuff, but a lot of it's junk. Let's, let's, let's sort through the, uh, the chaff and find, find the good stuff in here. So kind of leaders, leaders are, guide that process uh, very often and, and try, to, uh, try to, to rein in the children sometimes, if you will. Recently, a number of folks in this room have gone down to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and Fort Worth, Texas, and looked at how innovative those communities have been in creating their destiny. We then came home and there is beginning to be a movement in our community to look at extensive downtown redevelopment, looking out 30 to 40 years with regard to creating our community's future. But there's a lot of resistance. And I wondered if you, in your research, were able to see why some organizations had a greater bent toward being entrepreneurial, uh, allowing those three questions to be positively answered, and where other organizations would stifle and inhibit the ability to do that. Our community seems to be stuck in, we want to do this, but are we allowed to be creative? Are we allowed to take risks? And then what are the consequences for failure? So I wonder if you, got, you saw any different types that could help us in our need to move forward aggressively versus staying where we are. Yeah, and I, I, I guess you're talking about the visioneering effort and all, all what's been going on in the last few years. And, and your point's really well taken. Uh, there, there is an outstanding book. If you haven't read it, I would point you to it. It's called The Rise of the Creative Class by Richard Florida, who's an economist. And uh, I think what he's got to say on the topic is, is really relevant. What's really interesting about locales or locations, uh, geographic locations that, that have a lot of creative activity, innovative activity in whatever sense, artistically and organizationally, uh, is that they, are, they have a lot of inflow and outflow of people. There's a lot of immigration and emigration. Uh, this serves to do a couple of things, and, and it's one of the reasons in, intrinsically Wichita is at a disadvantage. We don't have a high rate of inflow or outflow. We tend to, to not have a large proportion of individuals moving here into the workforce. We tend to have individuals who stay here for a long time. And uh, the, the benefit of that is essentially 
a creation of diversity, a creation of new ideas, a, a bringing of different perspectives and ideas into a community that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And we all understand it's something that I didn't talk about, but I think you know, you've seen this in many places elsewhere, that one of the ways that idea generation is enhanced is through having a diversity of ideas. Diversity can be a double-edged sword because too much diversity engenders conflict and then you can't get anything done. So there has to be some modicum amount of it. But one of the things that, that, that I think you know, uh, balances that or hampers us here is that that lack of diversity means that the, the, the values that are so positive for Wichita, its stability, uh, the way it treats people, the way it treats families, uh, are also things that happen to be, that, 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 that stability gets in the way of creative action. I've, I've thought about that a lot, and I'm not sure I have a, a, a complete solution to that, except for finding ways to do those things that bring in different ideas or expose people, especially those that are opinion leaders or are going to be in the way, to those sorts of different ideas. The same thing plays in organizations. To the extent that organizations try to recruit and use individuals uh, who come from a diversity of backgrounds. And I'm not necessarily talking about ethnic diversity or gender diversity. Those are the things that we see. What we're really trying to get at, all of that diversity is really just a proxy for a diversity in perspectives and ideas. We use it because that's what we see and we presume that people who come from a different experience set will bring different, uh, different perspectives into the workplace. And it's probably the only thing we can do because we can't really know what's going on inside of people's minds. Uh, and so one way to begin changing a culture or encouraging creativity, it's, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, is to, uh, is to try to bring a lot of different points of view in place. Some companies try to do this by knowledge management systems, by finding ways to get information to individuals that they could not get otherwise. I was wondering, uh, in your research, when you mentioned other cultures like the Indian culture, were there... Uh, any things that you found that maybe we could pick up in our culture that they practice differently that would help us here or vice versa? Well, the interesting thing about creativity in the Indian culture is they have a much more cyclic view uh, of, of creativity as, as they do of, of anything else, even the ideas of uh, uh, that, uh, or traditional creativity, uh, traditional Indian religious ideas that individuals can be reborn and, and their souls recycled. That idea shows up uh, in the idea of creative uh, processes. Cre they see creativity as a process, not as a result, as opposed to our focus is very much, I mean, most of what we do is on results, and the process is secondary. So something to be learned there is, is that really it is the process or, or that we should be focusing more on creative processes. You mentioned selection issues, and, and there are definitely uh, ways that we can can use selection to enhance creativity, uh, but but I think you know some of what I've, I've said is that everyone can be creative, so it, you have to be careful not to go overboard with that too. What suggestions do you have for an organization that's wanting to move to a more creative culture? We're in the process of a culture shift, and we see creativity as a vehicle for growing our business. Do you have suggestions or tips for what we can do to? Yeah, be I successful? think you know, as with a lot of culture shifts. Uh, it has to come from top down and bottom up first, and probably you know bottom up sometimes is is the best way. Uh, there are more, there's more than one way to accomplish this. One way that comes to mind is to create a, a pilot group, if you will, carve out a small area of the organization where this can happen. Uh, find ways to, if you will, isolate, since the culture doesn't necessarily, the broader culture doesn't support creativity, find ways to isolate this, this, these individuals or these groups from the rest of the culture and create their own. And what they serve as, what, what you need is champions to, to champion a new culture. And often champion hap, championing happens by others seeing things happening, say, oh, I want to be that way, or that's good. Let's do this. And creating the opportunities for those small wins at first. Even, and I'm not talking about a lot of resources either, because I think it's a mistake to pour a lot of resources into that initially, but to create a different way of working and some things that are positive for the organization and that other employees can see that, oh, this would be really positive for us personally as well. 
And that's one way, there are others, but that's one way that comes to mind to begin building that culture from the bottom up. But obviously to do that also requires that commitment from the top to protect these individuals and to follow through on the different phases that would be required to expand that further out. Then later it gets expanded in terms of, of hiring and in terms of specific resource support and working that into reward systems and goal systems more broadly. If it has to be a performance goal, one of the things you talked about in, in uh, creativity direction was a performance goal somehow. That means it's measured. That means I'm either good or bad in my creativity or some level of, okay. of performance there. Um, so talk about the... I might have been, you know, I might not, have, I, in fact, I probably wasn't as clear as I needed to be because I was talking about, partly about creativity goals, but because individuals and, and often even small groups being creative is not the end point. It's, it's a starting point that we use to actually generate things that are, are more practical or useful for us to make money. Then what we ought to be looking at as much as anything is are individuals generating creative ideas? Are they trying to behave? Are they doing new things? Uh, it's also a development issue. When the first thing that individuals who are not necessarily the most creative types naturally uh, that we want them to do is to try to engage in that process then help them develop the skills. So there's a fine line between assessing and rewarding creativity and not punishing it versus making it such making it an outcome focused in other words make it more process focused. That mean, now, that doesn't mean that the process is ultimately what you want because, gee, we can have a creative process and we don't get anything out of it. It doesn't do us any good. But it is part of the job of leaders then to try to support that creative process, nurture it, and make sure that that process will develop, whether it's through collaborations with others or through improvements in individual capabilities, ultimately a creative product. But to actually just... Uh, evaluate individuals on the creative product at the end I think is a mistake. It's part of what has to happen ultimately but initially to try to develop these capabilities we have to be we have to be working the process. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.